Hello and welcome to the next of the Developer Essentials videos. So this time around we're going to be diving in and starting to look at scripting. So getting some initial understanding of what happens there, how to do some very, very basic things with that. Uh, so that means, as, as always, it's time for me to uh, retreat to the bottom of the screen. Um, and so I'm going to go through the process of setting up a new project. Now, I won't always be showing this in every one of the videos, but this is something that in particular in these early ones, I'm going to repeat that process of creating a new project, talking through my decisions there of what I'm creating and why, um, just so that that's something where you become a bit more familiar with that. So time for me to shrink down uh, so you can uh, enjoy, my, enjoy my desktop. Uh, the background is from Sea of Thieves. I am a very big fan of the game. And I am also very grateful that I don't actually know exactly my playtime for it, uh, but I do know that it is something where I, uh, I know the distance that I have sailed and the distance that I have sailed is actually a terrifying number. Uh, so that's why it's my background. Uh, let's get our project created and we'll be able to get up and running. So what we're looking at is scripting or programming, coding. You'll hear all different names for it. Uh, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about, in, e in every case, what it's referring to is a way of bringing logic into the game, of having it that the game is taking particular actions in response to different things. So it might be in response to stuff the player's done, it might be in response to input through a keyboard or a mouse or a gamepad, it might be in response to something that you know, an AI has done. But it's all it's really the key of what the, the scripting, the coding, programming is about. It's about actually including that game logic and writing what we're wanting to do there. Scripting is something that be super daunting early on. If your early reactions to scripting, and by early reactions, I mean these could be your reactions for the first few weeks, several weeks. If your early reaction there is, oh dear God, this is incomprehensible. How do I work with any of this? That's okay. Scripting takes time and it takes practice. So learning to script, it's like learning a new language. You know, you don't, you can't just go and pick up a, a dictionary of here's all the words for this other language. Cool. Now I can speak that language. You know, you, if you, if you tried to do that, you're likely going to be really incomprehensible because you're not going to have things in the right order. You might be using the wrong tense or versions of things. And that's the way it is with scripting. We need to take time and practice and just like with a language where we need to get it wrong at times to be able to then get it right, the same is true with scripting. We need to practice and make mistakes to get better at it. So we're able to be, you know, that's the really key thing. It's about persistence, it's about practice, and it's about continually coming back to it, of not giving up on it. I'm a firm believer that you can absolutely learn how to do this. It's going to take time and it takes different amount of time for different people and that's okay. But practice and perseverance with it, being patient and kind with yourself is really key to this. So that's stuff to want people to keep in mind with this is that it's going to take time, it's going to look incomprehensible and that's okay. It will come through time and practice and perseverance. So let's get an initial setup here. I'm going to start with, I'm just going to have, again, the old cube. Uh, so that's, we can see that in the game view here. So I'm going to attach a script onto it. Now there's two different ways that I can go about doing this. So first one I'm going to show you is, I'm going to first set up a folder, again, keeping things nicely organized. Uh, so within that folder, I'm going to create a script. 
So we can go create and then C sharp script. Now we can see here, uh, one of the things that is there in Unity now in newer versions is something called visual scripting. That is something I'll absolutely take a look at at some point. Uh, I'm a big fan of visual scripting. I use both often on projects. Uh, the thing I really like about visual scripting is it avoids you running into, you know, because one of the things with regular scripting where you're typing things out is you can so easily run into grammar mistakes, essentially, where you've got typos, things like that, and it breaks, and it's it's a nightmare. <laughs> it really is. Uh, you know, it was only a few days ago where I spent four hours tracking down a problem that was fixed by adding in four characters or another one where I had an hour and the problem was I had an extra space in one area and I didn't have it in another. So scripting where you're typing things out, the text-based scripting, you can get typos, you can get these errors. Visual scripting, you there it's a lot harder to do. There is it's still some possibilities at times, but it's significantly more difficult to have those problems happen. So I'm a huge fan of visual scripting. I think it's a really cool setup. In particular, I love it for rapid prototyping, for setting up stuff like um, logic that's happening at a level of, okay, the player's gone here, do this. Um, so visual scripting, we will absolutely be taking a look at that. Uh, and I think it's a, a really cool thing. You do sometimes get folks that are like, oh, visual scripting, that's, that's you know, the, 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 the lazy way. No, stuff those people, they're wrong. Uh, you'll also get other people that are, you know, like, well, visual scripting isn't real scripting. It's like, yeah, no, it is. And that's it. It is scripting. It's a very valid approach. And as someone who's been coding for 30 years, I use both and I love both. And I love both for different purposes. Just like you choose the engine based upon the team and the project, you choose the type of scripting based upon the type of thing you're doing. Now, early on, we're gonna focus on the text-based scripting um, because that allows us to do more typically. So those text-based scripting ones, you get full access to everything. Um, so we're going to go with that as the starting point for everything. So I want to select a C-sharp script. Now, naming of these is really, really, really important. You have to follow really careful naming conventions. So a couple of very key rules, no spaces. Absolutely never have a space in the name there. An underscore is okay, spaces are not. You can have numbers, but the numbers cannot be at the beginning. So I could have, you know, uh, 57 and then, you know, the name of the script, but I, that would actually cause problems, but I could have, you know, a name and then 57 afterwards and that would be okay. So key rules with naming this, the scripts, no spaces. If you're using numbers, they go at the end and symbol wise, you're pretty much restricted to an underscore. So no minus signs, no uh, plus, equals, exclamation marks, quotation marks. Keep it as just your standard ASCII letters and numbers, but numbers only at the end and never a space. Now, what will happen if you get them wrong is Unity actually won't be able to properly see the code. Uh, it will recognize the file is there, but it won't be able to use the information in it properly. Uh, so I'm going to call this demo movement. Uh, so when I'm naming scripts, I do like to uh, use this approach here, camel case, where I'm capitalizing each individual word. Once I've created that script, I can attach it onto this by dragging it over and I can drag it over here to where it then shows me with the little arrow. Uh, or I could have dragged it into the hierarchy here. You can attach the one script multiple times. So I could drag this over here like this and I've got two copies. I could go add component and I could type in demo and then I've got three. I really don't want that many. So I'm gonna actually go here and go remove component on all of these. Uh, and we'll notice that when with, with me using that mix of case, Unity actually automatically puts a space in there when it's appearing here. Uh, so now I can edit this. I can edit it by double clicking on the file or by double clicking on here where it says script and I can click on that. 
and then we'll be able to see uh, what we've got with the code. Now I am going to zoom in uh, a bit. So I'm using Visual Studio Code here. Uh, I recently updated it, which is why it's downloading extra bits there. Um, so Visual Studio Code, let me orient you a little bit in terms of this. So here, I've got my Explorer. That lists, I can see the various folders for the project, but it's also like scenes. I don't actually see my scenes file. I only see the script. So it filters out files that you actually can't normally edit. Uh, so I can, I've already got the demo movement open and this I can close or open that as needed. For now, I'm going to actually just leave it closed. And so this is what our code looks like. So if you've never seen code before or never you've know, gone through learning bits of code, this is going to look just like, well, it's a whole bunch of noise on the screen. What the hell does this do? So let me talk through the structure of this because there's with the, the thing with code is what we're doing with code is we are writing instructions for the computer, but the computer is a really, really literal thing. We have to tell it step by step. You know, we can't just generally go, okay, go and, you know, take, take this object over to this location. We have to tell it, okay, walk to the object, pick up the object, move to the location, place the object at that location. So we have to break stuff down into very specific, very literal steps for it. And so code is very literal. It does what you tell it to do. And it needs you to break it down into really fine grained steps. So here's the structure that we've generally got with this. At the beginning, we've got these things called using, and we're saying using you know, system collections, using system collections generic, using Unity Engine. What usings do is they bring in extra functionality. So it allows you to do different things. Usings is like acquiring different tools, different equipment. You know, if you acquire a particular tool, that might allow you to do something that you couldn't do before. That's what a using does. So using Unity Engine, that gives this script, this code, the ability to do a lot of common stuff within Unity. And we might need to add in other ones at times. So if we were doing some complex stuff with cameras, there's extra stuff we can bring in there so that we say, okay, no, I want the tools that bring in the extra cameras and allow me to work with those. So usings give us extra tools, gives us extra capabilities of what we can do. Then one of the things that we want to always be mindful of with programming is indenting is you, indenting doesn't actually change the behavior of the code, but indenting is a way of grouping and organizing things. So intact indenting is not for the computer, it's for us, it helps us understand it. So when we see indenting, we're seeing stuff grouped. So in this case here, we can see these bits of code we don't won't worry about what they actually do at the moment. These bits of code are indented. So they're grouped. And these braces, curly brackets, uh, they are a way we group things. And so the fact that we've got two ones here means we're saying that all of this stuff within those curly brackets is grouped under the thing immediately above the one that opens it. So the, the left brace, that indicates the start of a block, and the thing immediately before the left brace is the, the grouping, that type of block, the naming of it. And so what we can see here is we've got this thing where it's, okay, demo movement, well, that's what we called the file. And we've got this thing called mono behavior. So we will dive a lot more into what the specifics are here, what this really means in depth. But what this is saying is we're creating this thing called demo movement. We're creating a class and that class is related to this thing called a mono behavior. And if we go back to Unity, all of these things here are related to mono behavior typically. 
So having the, the thing relate to mono behavior is what allows me to attach it here. So this specifically allows me to attach this script to these game objects. That's what it's doing. So we've got this thing called demo movement. It's, called, it's this thing called a class. Don't worry too much about what those are at the moment. They're a way of grouping code, and we'll dive a lot more into those later. But for now, they're just a way of grouping code. Then we've got these things. And, we've, you know, Unity puts in some comments there telling us what happens, what they do. So we've got this thing called start, and it's saying it's called before the you know, first frame update. What that means is that this here runs. And when we're talking about code, you'll often hear the term runs or executes. So that means that whatever logic is there is happening. Whatever things it's trying to do, it will try to do those. So start is something that this demo movement will do once when it first is in the world. So if, it was, if demo movement was something we added in while the game is running, then start would do it at that point. If it's something that's already there in the world, then as soon as we hit play, start is going to run. Start will do whatever logic we need uh, to have happen there. Update, saying runs every frame. So with games, we're often talking about things called frames. So a frame is, Generally, we're looking, we're using that from the graphic sense of a frame is something we have sent to the GPU, that the GPU is putting is on the screen. So the number of times we present that picture, that image to the screen is how many frames per second. So update gets run every frame. So it allows us to do a little bit of work every time. So stuff that this could be doing. So what start could be doing is start could be, you know, say something getting placed in the world. Start could play a sound announcing that it's there. So, you know, say we've spawned a character in the world. Start plays a sound saying, yo, I'm here. Whereas update would be used to make that character move, to make them head towards a location. So it does a little bit of work every frame. So what update there is doing is, so say we're moving a character between two points. Update doesn't go, okay, cool, move to the next point, move to, you know, your destination. What it says is, okay, move a little bit of the way towards the destination. Now move a bit further, and every time it runs, it does that move a little bit of logic. So update runs continually. So these two things are something called functions, which again, functions we will look at a lot more detail later on. For now, Functions are a way to group code. So functions are a way that we create, just like using bring in extra tools, functions are a way to create our own tools. So we could create a function that, you know, makes a character bounce up and down. We could create a function that makes a character, you know, launch fireballs in the air. And then because we put that in a function, we could use that in lots of different areas. So functions create reusable things. Now within a function is where we put our code. So I'm gonna start with one of the most fundamental things we wanna have, and that's a way of getting information back of knowing whether a block of code is running. So we can do that using something called a debug log. So I'm going to say start function as run. And so we can start to see a bit of the structure for it. Now, as I said, code is very, very literal, very pedantic, and it's very pedantic about how it has to work. Case matters in C Sharp. So start with a capital S has a different meaning to start with a lowercase s. So case matters. And so punctuation matters as well. So you'll see lines of code where you're telling it typically to do something. So when you're telling it to take an action, those will typically end with a semicolon. So it's equivalent of like a full stop in a sentence. So this is saying debug log. So that's a way of displaying a message. 
We're using brackets here, the parentheses. So parentheses are similar to how braces group logic. So braces group multiple sections of code. Parentheses are used to group multiple bits of information, multiple bits of data. So the one bit of data this has got is this bit of text here. So parentheses group data, braces group logic. So we've got that written. Now we need to make sure we save. Such a common thing. 30 years of programming, I still run into the thing of I'll write code and then go and try to run and be like, why is my code not working? And it's because I haven't saved it. So if you run into that, then the good news is you have plenty of company because every programmer runs into that. Uh, and the bad news is that there is not really a point where that ever goes away. Um, so we've got this there. Now Unity has to process the fact that we've updated the script. So we can then run it. And what we will see, we can see this down here, start function is run. But if we click over here to console, we see more detail. Um, so console, anything we do a debug log with, it appears in the console. So start, it runs and it will output that message. Uh, and that's cool. Let's see what happens if we put it in update. So in a debug log, update has run. Again, making sure I save. And so now let's see what happens with this. So now when we run it, they start the update. And we notice the time's changing here and we can see this is ticking up. So this is because I've got collapse on here. If I turn off collapse, then, so what collapse does is if a message, two messages or more are the exact same, then it, collapses them into a single one and it shows you the count of particular ones there. So I'm going to turn collapse back on. But as we can see in a very, very short period of time, thousands and thousands and thousands of things come out there. Uh, so I'm going to turn these off, which this is another really helpful thing. So sometimes we don't want code to run. So if we want to turn off a bit of code, we can put two forward slashes in front of it. And that makes it something called a comment. So these are also a comment. So and comments will typically be given a particular color. Comments are a way of us describing what is happening in the code. Now that description, again, that description is for us, not for the computer. Computer doesn't care what's in the comments, but we do. So commenting the code regularly is really important. And you might be thinking, oh, well, I'm the only person working on this code. It's just short code. It's simple code. I don't need to comment on it. Here's why I recommend commenting the code. And there's a few reasons for it. The first is that if you are commenting the code, you're having to think about what the code is doing and describe what the code is doing. So it has you think about the code in a different way. Your, your brain is processing it differently to how it is when you're writing code. And that's actually a really valuable thing from a learning point of view. Just like you know, writing stuff out, once you've done it, taking notes, redoing the things helps you learn it. So does describing what you're doing. So really recommend doing that is taking the time to comment the code. So you've got those descriptions there. The other reason for it is it's a really good habit to get into because you will end up being on larger projects where it's necessary. And so if you're already in the habit, then you don't have a steep learning curve for it. You're just already doing it. Um, so it, it is clunky initially, and that's okay. In the early stages of learning you know, game dev, everything's gonna be clunky. So embrace the clunky. Embrace the clunkiness and just get more used to writing in those comments. Don't get too hung up on, you know, what you're necessarily saying there at first. Just initially get in the habit of writing those comments and you, you can go back and look at the code later and do updates to those comments. But really important to be making use of them and I really encourage that. So, okay, we've commented that out. Now, 
there's more bits we're going to take a look at. But first, you know, one of the things we want to have a look at is, okay, I mentioned that, you know, it's very pedantic and typos are a thing that's going to happen early on. So let's look at what happens with different typos. So first, I'm going to remove the semicolon from this. Now, Visual Studio Code is already highlighting that, yep, something's wrong. But let's see what Unity says. So Unity now tells me this. Now, this will give me out an error. Now, here's the thing with these errors. These errors will, sometimes the message will be like this. It's telling you exactly, okay, there's an error in this file. It is on line 10 at character 45. Sometimes it's going to be absolutely perfect and telling you exactly what you need to fix. That isn't always the case. Sometimes it will, it can give you wrong information. Other times it can, you know, you can fix one problem and 500 more appear. You know, the, the analogy of, uh, you've, you've got 50 errors, you fix one. Cool. Now I've got a hundred errors and it doesn't mean you've done it wrong because the important thing is, is the computer is trying to understand what we've written here. Now, we can have errors here that can really throw it, that can make it that it's not possible for it to interpret correctly the remaining bit of code. And so we can get, it can hide errors, it can generate false errors. So if I do something like uh, this, so I've removed, removed the brace, and then I come back here, and oh boy, so many errors. We've got 10 errors as a result of this. And it's indicating all these different lines. Now, one of the things, and when you encounter this, it's like, I've only, there's only one thing I actually need to fix, but you could easily get turned around with this because it's telling you, you know, that same message where, you know, we're expecting a semicolon. It's telling us, well, on this line, I'm expecting a bracket. But if I added that in, so it's saying, okay, at that point, I'm expecting this. That's not going to fix the problem. It's actually going to add in more problems. So when we have multiple errors like this, the approach to follow is we start at the beginning. We look at the first error, the one that is at the top of the file. So when we're fixing problems, we start at the top of a file and we work our way down. We never start at the bottom or middle, anything like that. You start at the very first error, the one that is at the highest point in the file, because that error could be causing false positives, like we're seeing in this case. And you know, this, when we go to it, it does indicate roughly the right line, but it's not indicating the correct fix. And that's the thing. Sometimes it won't indicate the right fixes. So we need to be with the errors. The key thing is we start at the, the highest one in the file, we start at the very top, we work our way down, and that's a very, that very systematic approach is key. Uh, we don't get alarmed if when we fix one thing, suddenly more errors appear. That doesn't, sometimes it can mean we've fixed it incorrectly, but it doesn't always mean that. So it's important to just be very methodical, very calm with the process of fixing them. And as soon as you encounter errors, stop writing more code. So early on, one of the big things to get in the habit of is as you're writing code regularly, every, I would say every 10, 15 minutes, go back and check and make sure that stuff is working, um, that you're not seeing errors because those errors, the longer you leave them before fixing them, the harder they can be to fix. And what you can find with things like uh, Visual Studio Code is as soon as you introduce an error, that can actually then throw off things like auto completion and other areas like that can break as well. So really important early on, just be getting to the uh, errors, you know, when you, when you encounter them, fix them as soon as you see them. Don't leave them linger for ages, just get them sorted. Okay. So we can see how we can display information. 
Um, and, you know, again, looking at other errors that might happen, say we tried to put a debug log here. Now, it's immediately starting to tell me that there's problems, like, uh, you know, the fact that it's not auto-completing is usually an indicator. So code can't sit outside these blocks. It has to be within these functions. There is something that can sit outside of these, though, because this, it's movement. I want to make this cube move. So when we're working out stuff like that, we want to think about, okay, well, I want it to move. What's one of the big things I want to be able to control with how it moves? Well, I probably want to be able to control how fast it moves. So I can set up something called a variable. A variable controls or holds information. So I'm going to set up a variable here. And I'm going to explain what this is doing in a moment. So this is going to be my movement per frame. So a couple of things of what's happening. So movement per frame is the name. So variables must have two things as a minimum. They must have a name. That name follows the same rules as the scripts, so no spaces. Numbers have to be, uh, can't be at the start, so they can be part way through, as long as there's a, a letter or an underscore before them, but they can't be at the start. So no spaces, no symbols, things like that. So variables must have a name. They must also have something called a type. So variables hold information and a variable can only typically hold one type of information. So just like you know, different types of you know, storage containers might be best for particular things, the same is true for variables. So you know, we, you, uh, I'm trying to think of a really good example and I'm immediately going towards food, possibly because it's near lunchtime. Uh, you know, you wouldn't typically go and uh, store, for example, uh, an, an apple in the freezer. You know, that container, that type there, doesn't really fit. So it's not going to work well for that. So types in the uh, programming sense are about the things of information we're going to store. So a vector three is something where it's storing something in 3D space. So this will allow us to say, I want to be able to move a certain amount that way, a certain amount that way, and a certain amount that way. So it allows us to control where and how it's moving. So vector three is a type that stores a 3D information. So it stores how we're moving in 3D. Now I've created that there and I've made it public. So for now, we're just going to be keeping things public. Um, we will dive into more of what that means and alternatives there. But for now, to keep it simple, we'll make it public. So I'm going to go back to Unity to see what happens. Because something specific happens with that. So we're going to see movement per frame. So that, because it was public and it was a vector three, we can now see, okay, well that gives us values here in X, Y, and Z, so I can change these. So I want it to move uh, two. Actually, no, it's gonna be per frame, so let's make that really small. Uh, let's make that 0.01 per frame. Uh, we're just going to move in Y. So, okay, we're moving per frame which that means we wanted an update. So what I can do here is, and this is something where, again, we will be diving more into what these actually do later, but so transform. Remember, every game object has a transform, and I can just access it by typing transform. And this, the dot, says, hey, transform, I want to access your position, and I want to set it, so I want to make it equal to, Take your current transform position and add the movement per frame. So if something's on the left-hand side of the equals, it is being changed. 
So we're saying transforms position becomes its position plus the movement per frame. Which what we should see then if we come back here and play this is this will start moving. And so we play it, we can see it's moving up. Now I can change these while it's running. And what I can do is now make that minus, and we can actually see the position here is updating. I could stop it by changing it to zero. So we've set up a variable that allows us to control stuff. And then we have gone and been able to change that and manipulate that. So once that's happening, what we can then also start to do is, well, maybe, maybe we want to have just a general control for speed. So I'm going to have, and so this is just like a, a, a throttle sort of accelerator option. So that's going to be something called a float. A float is a number that has a can have decimal component. So 3.2 is a float. 3 would be an integer. So an integer is a whole number, no decimal point, no decimal parts to it, whereas float is something that has a decimal part to it. So this gives us more fine control. For things like a speed, we're often using stuff like a, a float for it. So I'm going to create a float and that is going to be my speed. And I'm going to initially, so I can give this an initial value. Uh, and when we're working with floats, you'll see this notation. Floats, we always have an F at the end of the value we're setting for it. So now I can multiply this by speed. And what will happen is the higher speed is, the more the movement per frame, and the lower the speed is, the slower it'd be. But I set it to one, and let's see what happens when we go back to Unity in terms of what we can see here. So, okay, it's got the one value there, that's cool. So let's run this and see what we get. So, yep, yeah, cool. I could set that speed to minus one, and that will make it move down. I could set it to 0.5, and so now it'll move up, but slowly. And I might really like that speed, and that might be a case of, cool, 0.5, perfect. So I might come here and change this to 0.5, save it, and then come back here, and, oh, it's still one. This is an important thing to understand with when we're setting up these public variables. Once the variable's set up here and you've given it a value, as soon as you've attached that script, and you, you've seen when we modify a script and we come back to Unity, uh, there's a little bit of a pop-up saying that it's compiling the code and it's, it's updating the scripts. As soon as it has done that and seen that value, then it's already stored that value here. The information here is actually separate to what's said in the script. So if I wanted to change this, I actually have to, at this point, I can change it here in the inspector, or I can actually, if I reset it, then I could get it back to the 0.5, but then I need to reset my movement per frame. Uh, but the key thing is, is once we've set up the values there, most of the configuration of them, we have to do that in the inspector. So what I often will do is I will customize those values in the inspector, get them the way I want. Once I've got them the way that I want, I then go and attach, that will update them in the script. Um, because this only applies to this cube. So I'm gonna leave this cube at one, but we'll see if I set up now, let's make a sphere and I'm just gonna move the sphere in X and I'm going to give it the demo movement script, the sphere gets the value from the script. So the first time you attach a script onto something, it uses whatever values you've put in there for the variables in the actual script. The, once you've changed them though, then it's locked. So with this, if I went and changed this now to 0.25 and then come back, so it's doing the compiling of the scripts, everything like that. 
This has already seen the script, it's already compiled it once before, so the fact that it changed to 0.25 won't matter. So that's just the stuff we need to run, remember with this. And these two scripts are completely separate. They are doing separate logic there, and my sphere didn't move because I forgot to put in values here for it. But these scripts are completely separate. So you can have the one script attached onto different objects, and each copy of that script that's attached on is completely separate. So there's no communication that's currently happening between the cube and the sphere. Doesn't matter what one is doing, it won't affect what the other does. And here I was just saying where you could have multiple attached. Yep. So this, my sphere, I've got the demo movement and I'm also going to make it move in Z, but at a lower rate and we'll see that sphere each one is running on that now and it's moving in every axis. So multiple of the same script can be attached, which you can have that happen. You can accidentally do that. I've had a few cases where I've accidentally attached the same script multiple times. And then what's happening is it's trying to apply the same logic twice. And that might be a thing that you're intending to do, but if it's not, it can cause some really annoying bugs. So it's something just to watch out for with it. So, Key essential things from this stuff that I want you to be taking away from this. Scripts, the coding there, that allows you to set up your essential logic. And when we're naming our scripts, no spaces ever in the names of the scripts. Only letters, underscores, you can use numbers as long as they are not at the beginning of the name of it. I recommend using a camel case approach where you've got you uppercasing each the first letter of each word because Unity will then interpret that and put in spaces in between. You can attach scripts onto things. The same script can be attached onto multiple objects or multiple times onto the same object. When we're then looking at the script, we have our usings block. Usings blocks bring in extra tools. They give us more things that we're able to do. Braces are used to group logic. Parentheses are used to group information. So logic does particular actions. It makes decisions, it applies changes. Parentheses hold data often about those changes. Our code is always going to be sitting with inside functions. So the bits of code that do things, that take actions, sit within functions. Functions are a way of creating our own tools. They group code and allows us to reuse it. One of the common things we're using is something called a debug log. It's a way of indicating that a particular area of code has run. And we can also use that to get information out. When we use a debug log, those will appear in the console. The start and update functions are always there from the beginning. Start runs at the very beginning for an object. So either if the object is there from the very beginning in the scene, then it will run as the level loads. Or if you add the object in later, then the script will run at that point and it will run start at that point. So it's run at the, the very first moments that this script sits on something in the level. And we'll see the script, because we, we've currently got it on two things, there's actually script is running, that start one is running twice, each one runs up. So the things that we attach a script onto are separate and independent. Update runs every frame. So we can do a little bit of work every frame to update things in our game. We can store information in things called variables. Variables always have a name and they have a type. So it always goes type and then name. 
The name follows the same rules as for the classes. No spaces, we're using letters, we're using underscores, we can use numbers as long as they are not at the beginning. Using approaches like camel case or similar are good to make it easy to identify them. And that creates a name that refers to that bit of information. And the type describes what that information can look like, the shape of it essentially. So a vector three holds information that has, uh, is for 3D space. A float holds a single number, but a single number that can have decimal values. So point, the information after the decimal point. So 3.2 can be stored in a float. A float can also store integers like, like three or five, um, but float is generally we're using that when we're working with things that we might want to do something, point something else. So variables have a name and a type. Now we've got some very minimal logic here in the code. And what we're saying is we're access, we're saying, hey, transform, which transform describes where wherever the object that this is attached to in the world is. So we're saying, hey, grab your position. So it's position and make it equal to, set it to your position plus that little bit of movement times by the speed. So we can update things using equals. Whatever is on the left-hand side will be changed. Whatever is on the right-hand side of the equals is what you're changing it to. With our code, case matters. And that's one of the easiest problems to run into is having the case wrong on things. So if debug log started with a lowercase d, it's going to get cranky at me and we'll see things saying where it doesn't exist. And those are hard to spot because it's a single character that's wrong. So case matters. We need punctuation. So we need things like our semicolons at the line, end of lines where we're doing something. So, you know, bring in this tool. We're taking an action. Create this variable, taking an action. Display this in the console, move the transforms position. We're taking actions. So when we take actions, we have semicolons at the end of the line. So those are the key bits of grammar we need to be aware of with this. Now, in terms of where to sort of go from here, there's a couple of things that I recommend. So as I was saying at the beginning, practice is essential with this. Practice is absolutely key. You won't get better at game development by not practicing it. And that practice is going to be frustrating. You are going to run into errors and you are going to run into problems. That is a good thing. And the key there is you want to run into errors and problems. You don't want to slowly, occasionally, intermittently walk into errors. This is at the very beginning of you, you learning these areas. Run into it. Run into as many errors as fast as you possibly can. Because the more errors you run into, the more you will learn how to fix and how to avoid. One of the big things early on is building up this memory of, oh, okay, I'm seeing this error. Here is the fix for it. That's one of the biggest differences between a ex highly experienced programmer and a junior programmer. It's not just about the areas that they might know, the tools that they know. It's about the problems they've run into. They've seen the problems before, so they know how to fix them quicker. So run into problems. Make errors in your code. That's fine. And that's the big thing I want you, really encourage you to be doing early on. Practice the code. Make mistakes. Have things go completely wrong. It's fine. It's okay. That's actually part of the process. If you're writing code and you're getting dozens of errors and you had to spend a bunch of time fixing them, you haven't failed. You haven't messed up. You have done exactly the right thing to be doing. You have done the right processes for learning there and you've persevered with it. You've been patient with yourself and stuck with it and learned how to actually solve the problems. So practice is essential with it. 
because we're going to be diving into more areas in future videos and we're going to be early on focusing really heavily on a lot of coding side of things. So practicing there is going to be key. Make sure you're practicing regularly and it's you have faith in yourself, have patience with yourself, be kind to yourself. This is stuff that you can absolutely learn. It's going to take time and that's okay. Key thing is practice and run into problems, run into so many problems because that's the way we get better at it. That's all for uh, this video. There's going to be many, many more uh, coming up and I really hope it's been helpful and you'll be able to find links to the, the code and everything in the description below. Uh, and if you're wanting to help support me doing these videos, there is also a link to my, my Patreon below there. Any assistance there is going to help me continue to make videos like this, um, which is going to let me help more people like yourself uh, be able to become game developers and make cool games and that's 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 a win for everyone I want to I want to see more cool games because I want to get to play them so that is all for now thank you